This is IBM, the Islamic Broadcasting Network. The following program is sponsored by the Islamic Media Foundation, sharing the guidance of Allah through broadcast media and the Internet. This is Youth Talk, a show for youth and about the youth, discussing the issues of today and tomorrow, with your host, Hana Baba. Assalamualaikum. Welcome to another edition of Youth Talk for today. Thank you for being with us. I'm your host, Hana. And another reminder, if you don't know, now you know that we are on every day, every weekday, inshallah, from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can tune in to Youth Talk at www.ibn.net. And you can reach me if you would like to send me any suggestions or comments at youthtalk at ibn.net. Again, the email is youthtalk at ibn.net. When you read a good book... Do you ever wonder what it took to write it? Have you ever tried to imagine what kind of effort and knowledge and determination it took for it to be complete and in your hands? Writing is not an easy job. It takes a gift and determination. And writing for children may sound easier, but is it? Today we have with us an award-winning Muslim author and storyteller, whose contributions to children's writings have been critically acclaimed and recommended over continents. Her books are common in the homes of thousands of Muslim and non-Muslim families and school, school and public school libraries in the U.S. and Canada. And she's with us today on Youth Talk to tell, her about, to tell us about her experience and hopefully benefit those of you who are working to become authors in the future. Who is it? We'll find out when we come back from this break. You're listening to Youth Talk. If the way you dress expresses how you feel, and your dress speaks about you, then your dress not only makes a statement, but it is an important part of your identity. These are American Muslim women. Their dress reflects their faith and their belief in modesty. This message has been brought to you by your American Muslim neighbors. This public service announcement is brought to you by the Islamic Media Foundation. And welcome back to Youth Talk on IBN Radio. I'm your host, Hanat. And today we're proud to have with us uh, one of uh, the award-winning Muslim authors and storytellers. Her contributions to children's writing um, have been critically acclaimed, recommended from the U.S. all the way to Europe and around the world. And uh, we're glad to have her with us today. With us is Sister Ruksana Khan. Welcome to the program. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for being with us today. Oh, thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, can you introduce yourself, not that you really need introduction uh, to most of our listeners, but why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Well, I was born in Lahore, Pakistan. I came to Canada when I was about three years old. And um, because of my growing up, it was very difficult, cause, but this was back in the 60s and 70s, and the racism was blatantly in your face. Um, I actually retreated to books as a kind of refuge. And then when I was in grade 8, my teacher, he, he told me that I, I was a writer. And I just thought that would be amazing to be able to write stories. And then it became a dream of mine. Did you enjoy reading a lot of stories at the time? Does it take uh, someone who loves to read to be able to write? Oh, definitely. Okay. I, lo I lived in books. When I was growing up, I lived in books. They were my escape. And I loved them. If I had a good book, it didn't matter what was on TV. Um, it didn't matter what anybody That's else more than was. a lot of youth can say. <laughs> <laughs> I was just one of those readers. Mm. But I kind of became a reader because my father, he was very strict with the television. Mm -hmm. And um, even with reading, if he saw me reading too much, he used to kind of give me something to do. Um, but uh, So I, I, I started reading in, in closets. So I would just <laughs> hide so that nobody could find me. They couldn't give me work to do. Yep, that's a passion. Uh-huh, definitely. <laughs> 
And when did you actually start writing? Um, can you tell us? Can, of course, you remember. When did you start writing? Well, the first thing I started writing was about when I was 14, when this teacher told me that I was, I was a writer. And I started this novel, a very awful novel, about a, a Carla the Gypsy Girl who was secretly a Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> and she has all these adventures and everything. And I went on for about 276. Seven pages. Wow. Of, yeah. Well, I just she just had adventures after adventures, and then I kind of ran out of stuff for her to do, and I didn't know how to end it, mm-hmm. so I kind of just stopped there. <laughs> and um, and then when I was sixteen, I wrote a picture book that actually became kind of the reason I became uh, a published because this picture book I wrote this picture book uh, called Waldo the Worm, uh-huh. and it's about this boy worm who. Um, meets this girl worm, and he wants to impress her, so he acts like Tarzan, but he falls. <laughs> and it's, it's so humiliating, so he leaves. And the girl worm, her name is Matilda, she was playing hard to get, and he, she realizes how nice he is, and she, so she chases after him, and they, they get together, and they live happily ever after. Oh, now what is a picture book? When you say picture book, does that mean just a book that has pictures or a book that is predominantly um, you know, laden with pictures or what? Well, a picture book generally has a, a standard format of 32 pages, and it has a little bit of text, and it has a picture to go with the text. Um, so basically your standard f- um, picture books in the, um, like the, the smaller children's books, mm-hmm. um, and Waldo was definitely one of those. It was a picture book, and I, a picture book, and I drew the pictures for it. Oh, um, so you're an artist too. Not really. <laughs> Um, I tried, but I, like I'm not good enough to really pursue it now. Mm. And in fact, I I was kind of when I heard about I used to be able to actually even make likenesses of mm-hmm. draw people and make likenesses and everything. And then somebody told me about the hadith about ha- being having to put life into it and on the day of judgment. And I, so mm-hmm. I kind of had to give that up. Mm-hmm. And um, instead, what I did was I poured all of that creativity into my writing instead. Because I feel like you have only a certain amount of creative energy, and you can either divide it up in different aspects of art, or you can pour it into one and try to do the best you can in that. That's that's so right. That is that is absolutely right. I always thought that an artist is an artist is an artist. Um, someone who is able to express themselves in writing would be able to express themselves in in painting. Would be able to express themselves in other forms of art. Oh, definitely. But the thing is, if you want to be professional. Um, it, that's another uh, that's another uh, field. Like mm-hmm. you can you can express yourself creatively in art, and I do that. I I still doodle, I still draw, and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. I don't try to attain the professional status with it. Mm-hmm. Like to me, th- that's reserved for the writing because that's uh, the professional pursuing something professionally is a whole different ball game. Ball game. Mm-hmm. I can I can imagine you'd have mm-hmm. to do a little studying. And oh, definitely, definitely. You have to look at genres. You have to look at everything else. Everything else that's out there. You have to look at for art. For art, you'd have to look at styles, mm-hmm. and there are so many different styles, and and you have to make yours own, your own unique style. And and that's what I've done with the writing, is that I try to address it in my own unique perspective. And what age groups do you write for? Um, are, is there a particular age group that you target, or have you tried different age groups within? Um, um, the youth. Well, I tend to I tend to tend, tend to not think about age group when I'm writing. Mm-hmm. I just write the story that comes to me, uh, something that sparks my imagination, that uh, mo- that it moves me emotionally. Is something in, and and that could be a song, it could be a poem, it could be a shorter picture book, it could be a novel. It just depends. Um, it seems though that my writing tends to be quite complex. So it's a. I would say it's for older kids. I would say probably from about seven and up. Seven and, and up. Mm-hmm. Oh, and that's the older kids. Okay. Old, well, yeah, those are older. Like, I can't seem to do simple, simple stories like like preschool kind of stories. Mm. You know, like like stories about every day. You know, happy little stories that mm-hmm. I call them fluffy stories. Like, yeah. you know, I, I mean, they're really deceptively simple, but I can't do those. You you have a picture book um, called Bedtime Ball. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's how I'm going to say it. Um, and um, it's 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 the standard 32 pages, mm-hmm. and it's gotten great reviews. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, that book and uh, what led you to write it? I guess that's one of the books that you would call um, for the younger folks, right? Yeah, that would be for younger folks. Although 
looking back at it, I probably would have simplified some of the language. If I could edit it again, I would go back and simplify it. It was also my first book. Um, I got the idea for that. Oh, it was so funny because what happened was I was babysitting at the time, and this was when I was still dreaming of being a writer, and this was back in 1996. And I used to babysit this really obnoxious little kid. He was about three years old. <laughs> and you old. wanted her go to go to sleep? Oh, no, no, no. That's not what happened. Okay. I, I, I got up for Fudger, for Fudger prayer. Mm-hmm. And this was in the summer of 96. And it was Fudger in the summer is about 5, five o'clock in the morning, four thirty, five 5 o'clock. Uh-huh. And um, I, I tried to get back to sleep, and I couldn't. And I thought at 7.30, this obnoxious little kid is coming. <laughs> I need to get to some sleep or I'm going to want to throttle him. You know, he just <laughs> drove me nuts. And I thought, oh, I've got to get to sleep. I've got to, I've got to. So I was tossing and turning. And finally I thought of counting sheep. And I thought, okay, let me try to count sheep. So I, I made my mind all blank. I imagined some sheep and I imagined a fence. And I said, okay, sheep, start jumping. And most of the sheep were compliant. They started jumping. But there were a couple in the corner. And they were chatting away to each other. And one of them was an old ram. And I said, come on, sheep, start jumping. And the old ram, he just gave me this look. And he just said, who the heck are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at the cover, and he looks pretty mean. <laughs> he is. He's the old really ram with the, with the spectacles he, and, and his little horns. He looks yeah, really he, stubborn. Well, he leads the others in mutiny, really. And and this poor little girl, she's the one who set up the situation, but she gets into, into her own at, by the end of the story. Mm-hmm. And it's really kind of about empowerment and having power over your own dreams and your own imagination. That's, that's some imagination, mashallah. <laughs> I don't know too many people who can who can think that way and put it in writing and make it so attractive. Alhamdulillah. You're listening to Youth Talk uh, on IBN Radio. I'm your host, Hanat. With us is Sister Ruksana Khan. And um, I don't think she needs any introduction. Award-winning Muslim author and storyteller, we're talking to her today, and uh, we'll take a short break. We'll be right back after the break. You're listening to Youth Talk. What can we do to stop the killing? Thou shalt not kill. We know what to do. Do unto others as you would have Do them. what is right and condemn what is wrong. Killing a person unjustly is like killing all humanity. Some rules are not meant to be broken. They are golden. Every one of us is precious. Be humankind. A message from your American Muslim neighbors. This public service announcement is brought to you by the Islamic Media Foundation. Support IBN by making a pledge today, a dollar a day, to the Islamic Media Foundation. Help IBN programs to continue by making your monthly contribution today. Pledge a dollar a day. Online at www.ibn.net or call us to pledge over the phone at 703-241-9659. Help us continue to be your voice, the voice of American Muslim. Yep, you guessed it. You're listening to Youth Talk here on IBN Radio. Salam alaikum once again. Uh, if you don't know, now you know. We're on every day, every weekday, from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, if you know somebody who can't catch us live, we're always in our archives on the Internet. Go to IBN.net at any time, click on Archives and Today's Date, and you'll find today's show. So um, hmm, can't get easier than that. And today with us is um, someone I'm very proud of, an award-winning Muslim author uh, and storyteller who's written a number of books, acclaim around the world. Her books are in uh, libraries, school libraries and public libraries all over the U.S. and Canada. And she happens to be with us today. Sister Ruksana Khan, thank you again for being with us. Well, thanks for having me. Um, now, where where do you get the inspiration and ideas for your books? Are they from your own life, like you just told us from the story um, for Bedtime Book, or do you have any other um, you know avenues? Oh, it depends. Most of them, most of the stories that I've written are something that have that has touched me emotionally. Um, when I was in, a teenager, there was a girl who was in my class. She had very big breasts and she tried to commit suicide. And when, when this happened, I didn't speak up for her. 
uh, because, I, like I mentioned, my, my, my growing up years were just awful, and the racism that was against me, I was really persecuted a lot. Mm-hmm. So to speak up for, on her behalf would have um, further jeopardized me, but I was so angry at the popular kids who were mocking her. They actually had a mock two-minute silence for her because she had tried to commit suicide. Mm-hmm. And it was just awful. And I thought, from then on, I thought, I do not want to be like these people. I want to be different from them. And that was like the catalyst of my writing my novel, mm-hmm. Darling, If You Love Me, Would You Please, Please Smile. Darling, If You Love Me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was, like 20 years later, it still haunted me that I didn't speak up and I didn't have the courage to say something. And so I gave the character in that book, I gave her the, char- the courage to do that. That the courage that I hadn't had at the time. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so a lot of your writing does come from within and from yeah. stories that you've lived. Well, in some ways, yeah. But like, I took, I take that one kernel and I run with it. Like, I, I explore different things, and so much of it is really out of the imagination. Mm-hmm. So, it, it, that might spark it, but then it, the creative process itself kind of takes it and makes something new out of it. Now, one of your one of your great books that got um, many great reviews is The Roses in My Carpets. Mm-hmm. And I believe there's a personal story behind this book, too. You oh, want definitely. to give us an idea about the book and why you wrote it? Oh, okay. I went to visit my Afghan refugee foster child. Um, back you in sponsored 19... a child in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In 1992. I sponsored him through Human Concern, which was a Muslim organization. And they were based in Peshawar, Pakistan. And I was born in Pakistan. And the first time I ever went back was in 1992. So I was like 30 years old, and I had gone back for the first time. Wow. And I went up to Peshawar, and I visited him. And based on that visit, uh, I wrote The Roses in My Carpets. And it took me, that book actually took me four years to write. And the, and the funny thing is that um, I won an award, an international literary award for that book Masala. from Poland. <laughs> Mashallah. Yeah, I, I couldn't really read the name of the award. Well, basically but... the award's named after this Jewish children's writer from World War II. Wow. And they, the Polish Ministry of Culture, they choose six books in the world every two years, uh-huh. and they give these books the Janusz Korczak Award. And I guess I'm the only Muslim probably who's won an award named after a Jewish guy. Wow. Well, now, now, without giving the whole book away, why don't you give us just an idea about what we can expect in it? Well, basically with that book, what happened was I wanted to put myself in the position of my foster child. And what I, I ended up writing it not from his point of view, actually, but from his brother's point of view. Because when I was looking at the photographs, uh, I had, originally I had written a story about my visit, but it was a very, it wasn't, it didn't have the emotional impact that I really wanted. So I went back and I revisited it, and in looking at the pictures that I had taken when I was there, I came across a picture of his older brother, Mm. and he had a very haunted look on his face. And in order to understand why, um, I had to put myself into his position and try to see things from his point of view. And when I did, the whole impact of what they had been through really was overwhelming. Especially coming from affluent Canada. Yeah, definitely. Because I'm not a I'm not a refugee. I'm not a, I'm not even Afghani. I'm uh, I'm Pakistani, uh, and I was kind of scared that some Afghans would come up to me and say, "Well, how dare you write about our culture? You didn't get it right, and blah blah blah. You don't know what you're talking about, and all this kind of thing." Because I've done that myself to many many white authors who mm-hmm. attempted to write about Muslim culture. They really don't get it right. That's true. That's and true. so well, you were afraid you'd get the same. Oh, I was afraid. But then what happened was after it was written, I gave it to my Afghan sister-in-law. And she read it, and she said, well, you know, it, wasn't, it was worse than that. And I said, yes, I know, but I had to tone it down for Western audiences mm. just to make it believable. But then she ended up giving it to her brother to read. And her, her brother is like her older brother, and he was like a big, tough Afghan guy. Oh. And he broke down sobbing. <laughs> oh. And I thought, yes, I got it. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I wasn't worried after that if anybody was going to come up and challenge You shouldn't be. Yeah, no, I wasn't. I thought, no, I think. Do I you have a favorite book that you wrote? That's I one think that's it would probably closest to your heart. Yeah, the roses in my carpet. The probably roses. my clo- the closest to one to my uh, to my heart. By the way, to all our listeners, um, Roxana has a great website on uh, on the internet where you can find all her books and a little idea about um, how to get a hold of them, what they're about. Uh, very interesting articles that he, she has up there. www.roxanacon.com, and that's spelled. R U K H S A N A K A 
I'm sorry. Let me start that again. R-U-K-H-S-A-N-A. K-H-A-N dot com, Ruxanacon dot com. Um, if you're listening to us online right now, you might want to open up another window right now and just uh, go visit it and look around while you're listening to, to the program. Uh, Sister Ruxana, what, what about a favorite book in general? Um, do you have a favorite all-time book that you, that you oh. can't get enough of? I would have to say Mara, Daughter of the Nile by Eloise Jarvis McGraw. Can you tell, tell our listeners a little bit about it? Oh, it's about it's set in ancient Egypt uh, during the rule of Hatshepsut, and it's like an ancient Egyptian spy novel. <laughs> oh, it was so much ancient fun. Egypt, ancient Egyptian 007 sort of. <laughs> yeah, well, she was a double agent between the. Um, there's like a treason going on. There's like a uh, what, what would you call it? A rebellion, okay. and she so she's a double agent between the, the queen spies and then those who are trying to overthrow her. Yeah. And it's just an amazing book. I loved it as a kid. Um, I almost stole it from the library. <laughs> and that was the only book I've almost stolen. And then when I grew up, I <laughs> found it. And I, well, because when I was a kid, I didn't know you could buy books. I, I always thought you could just get them from the library. And I loved it so much, I hid it under my mattress at home. And I went to the library and I told the librarian that I had already returned it. <gasps> And I kept it for about a month before my conscience got the better of it. Yep, you're a book lover. Oh, I loved this book. Do you have a favorite writer? um, I think probably, I like so many. I like Mark Twain. I like, um, I love Eloise Jarvis McGraw. I've read everything of hers. Mm. Um, I love Mark Twain. I like Jane Austen, Charlotte Bronte, Oh, G. Catherine Patterson, um, Mary Stewart. Oh, there's so many. I have so many favorite authors. And what do you have children? Uh-huh. That's correct, right? Mm-hmm. What do you what do your children think about your books? Do you consult <laughs> with them in writing the story to test it first? That's what oh, I would definitely. do if I were you. Definitely, I do. Um, my children. I have four children. The oldest is eighteen, and the youngest is eight, and there's twin daughters in between. Um, the twin daughters, they're the most uncritical. Mm-hmm. They love my books, especially the novels. They love the novels. Mm-hmm. And my oldest one is like my severest critic. Okay. <laughs> she is very critical, but at the same time, she's 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 very um, she's got a real high standard in terms of literature. Mm. She's very well read, and uh, she knows a lot about books. And 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 she has told me like if she tells me that okay, I found it interesting, that is like high praise, and oh. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, but she also she also confesses that my books are, are too young for her. Like okay. she's gone past that that age group that I write for. Do you think anyone's following in mommy's footsteps? Um, possibly one of my daughters, especially one of the twin daughters. Actually, both of the twins have started recently to write poetry. Oh, and they're pre- quite good, quite good, really. And one of them in particular, she was a storyteller, and she was going to um, she was even hired by the Toronto Har- Harbourfront uh, Storytelling oh, Festival. Wow. Yeah, and she was paid the same as me and everything. That gave okay. her a real kick. <laughs> she loved it. So would you would you encourage them to go oh, the same way? Mm-hmm. Well, well, I wouldn't Some people, them. I ask you this question because some people in other professions, for instance, some doctors I know or lawyers would say, what I went through, I don't want my children to go through. So would you say the same? Well, it's an incredibly competitive field. What you have to understand is that um, publishers get about 5,000 manuscripts a year. And they might choose one or two, so it's an incredibly, incredibly competitive field. And for stability's sake, I wouldn't <laughs> suggest them becoming a writer because it's really, really hard. Okay. See, so the rule goes even, you know, uh-huh. goes across the board. <laughs> the lawyers, doctors, and now writers also don't want their children to be writers. Well, not unless they've got a passion for it, they, and and if they can find satisfaction, even just in the creative process itself. Then I would say go for it, because you, because the creative process is rewarding in itself. Publish being published isn't necessarily a guarantee. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and if you enjoy the creative process, then by all means you, you're going to do that. You're going to you're going to create. Um, you're going to write no matter what what happens. Now, and, Roxana, what should a writer keep away from when writing for children? Is are there some no nos? For oh, instance, um, you mentioned in one of your articles online, uh, let me uh, tell everybody your website again, www.roxanacon.com, and you can find a number of uh, beneficial articles for you aspiring writers mm-hmm. in our audience. You mentioned in one of them that 
uh, one of the struggles that you had was trying to stay away from world politics in your stories. Yeah. Um, that's one challenge. Are there any things that, uh, any other things that people should sort of stay away from when writing for kids? Yeah. Uh, don't preach. <laughs> don't preach. <laughs> don't preach. Mm. Um, what you need to do is, if you have, if you have something, that, a point that you want to make, there's nothing wrong with that. Go ahead with, with your point. But always keep it in the back of your mind. The story itself has to come first. And you have to be faithful to the story. And if you're faithful to the story, what you've got in the back of your mind, what the point you're trying to make will come through. And, and it will come through in a more natural and um, entertaining way. Mm. That's what will happen. Um, with, with my writing, my main agenda in writing, if you could call it that, is really to humanize Muslims. Uh, to use story to show our perspective of things and that we're not as, as strange as we look, basically. That's mm-hmm. what, what I'm trying to do with my writing. Mm-hmm. And, um, and we need that now more than ever. Oh, definitely. More than, more than ever. And in fact, I feel like sometimes I feel like I'm in a very opportune place. Like I'm in a place where it's, like, there's a huge demand for Muslim literature and a lot of publishers are really keen on on exploring Muslim literature, um, but you need to kind of still write something that will appeal to the masses and not just that will appeal to Muslims. You have to write beyond that. That's right. Do, do you have any project in the making? The other day I was thinking about this when I was reading about your struggle to stay away from world politics. Um, do you or anyone you know has have any um, intentions to write like a little story about a Muslim girl and the day after 9-11, for instance, um, any, anything that has to do with September of last year, or should that be something that we should keep away from regarding the kids? No, I don't think it, anything. There's not really any subject that you need to keep away from. In terms of 9-11, what I would like to do is to try to put things into more of a global perspective. Um, and I thought that the, like I thought, I thought that it needs time. It needs time for things to settle down a little bit more before you can really analyze it. And as a Muslim, because the thing is that there are grievances that other parties have, and some of these are quite legitimate grievances. And it's a whole situation that the Western people do not understand. Sometimes I feel like I'm a bit of a bridge mm-hmm. between the two different cultures. The That's absolutely culture. right. Yeah, between the Muslim culture and the non-Muslim culture. And and so many times I feel like I'm being stretched, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to put things into a perspective without coming across as having a political agenda. And it's really hard. Like 9-11 to me is a political act. Mm. It was a political act. And it's very diff- it, it involved so-called Muslims. And it was completely condemned in Islam. Completely, mm. pre- There's no room for it. But then on the other hand, um, there were circumstances. Like, I, I, I happen to believe that people are actually quite logical. And every culture has their own internal logic where things make sense and they have their point of view, their perspective. And sometimes it's quite skewed in a certain, towards a certain slant. Mm-hmm. And Westerners have their perspective and their internal logic. And as Muslims living in the West, we can understand that. We That's can see true. that they're not all bad. They've got some really good qualities. And there's a lot of good things here. But there's a lot of misunderstanding. Oh, definitely. There's a lot of misunderstanding. And I would say it's on both sides. I would say it's in the Muslim cultures where they tend to vilify the West, and it's also in the Western cultures where they tend to vilify Muslim cultures. And, and hopefully your books will try to, um, you know, mend, oh, yeah. mend and, make, and make bridges. Mm-hmm. They're already doing that, actually. Well, I'm trying. I'm doing my best. And I've been quite... Um, I, it's funny because Darling has a quite, a, quite a hefty religious undertone to it. It has a lot of um, religious undertone where there's this, the older sister, Layla, you see, what I did was um, I wanted to include some information about Islam, but I wanted to do it in a non-didactic, non, not boring kind of a way. Uh-huh. And so what I did was I had this older sister who's a real, oh, she's a real pain in the neck. Okay. And she man- uses Islam to manipulate her younger sister. Oh. And in that way, like, I mean, I have one scene where she's, while Zainab, the main character, is praying, you know, her older sister Layla comes around, 
and checks to see if her nose is touching the floor. And she and she puts her foot on her on her butt when she goes down for sajud, and she says, "Get your bum down," and all this kind of stuff. Oh, and Mimi, <laughs> she's very the mean sister. She's very mean, but it was a way of actually introducing the Islamic information in a way that that furthered the plot. It was actually part of the plot because the story, n- the novel Darling is really about manipulation, and this mm-hmm. was a, f- a form of manipulation. And um, so it furthered the plot. It was actually essential to the story. And it's funny because a lot of non-Muslim kids reading it, they found it absolutely fascinating, mm. all the stuff about Islam. And I was really surprised because I asked them, well, did you find it like preachy or, or didactic in any way? And they said, no, 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 not, not at all. Mission accomplished. Mm-hmm, definitely. definitely. How important is it for a young Muslim to identify with a book character? For instance, when I was growing up um, in, in Houston, Texas, in the 80s, there w- I don't remember going to my school library and finding a book, not even one, that had a Muslim character in it or somebody um, who, who, you know, called themselves Muslim or anyone whose name was Ahmed or Maryam or something like that. Um, but thanks to you and other authors, um, that is happening today. How important is it for a child to open a book and say, hey, there's a Muslim, you know, just like uh-huh. me? It's vital. It's absolutely vital because it's all a part of validating um, their experience. And this is... This is actually one of the good things about the culture here is that they do believe in including books. Like, like it's, there's like an agenda within the library systems, within the school systems, to include the experiences of Muslim kids. And um, that's a really noble sentiment, to make them feel like they belong. And in order to do that, they need to see themselves being represented in, in, in literature, in oh. um, media, in all different facets of life. And like like recently, um, in for better for, or for worse, that comic strip, they showed uh, a Muslim character in line. I mean, just seeing that, it just makes you feel good. And yeah, it, even if it's an extra in a oh, movie, definitely. you know, one of the people just walking down the street, hey, there's a Absolutely. scarf, you know. Absolutely. It just shows that we belong. And for too long, we've been excluded. And um, I guess because they feel very threatened and they feel quite um, uncomfortable because uh, it, it's not something you can just randomly insert that easily. Uh, somebody in hijab or somebody who's identifiably a Muslim. So this is something that we need to work on. And yet they're looking for this. They're actually, Uh the publishers, the media, they're actually looking for um, stories and points of view from Muslim characters. Well, we're on our way, inshallah, hopefully. Uh, And uh, you're listening to Youth Talk on IBN Radio, www.ibn.net. Uh, let me give you another website uh, that you can go to um, and listen and watch, look at some of the books by Sister Ruxana Khan, www.ruxanakhan.com, and her first name is spelled R-U-K-H-S-A-N-A, and then K-H-A-N.com to uh, take a look at all her works and much, much more. And we'll take a break. We'll be right back with more on Youth Talk. Every day, new friends are made, and old friends are drawn closer. And from time to time, friends fall in love. If it's true love, the kind that stands the test of time, then everyone celebrates. Marriage, it's worth waiting for. This message has been brought to you by your American Muslim Neighbors. This public service announcement is brought to you by the Islamic Media Foundation. For Youth Matters, Muslim World News, National News, Islamic Information, Muslim Scholars Insights, Business and Legal Advice, and the hottest debates on current affairs, tune in to IBN, the Islamic Broadcasting Network, the voice of American Muslims. Welcome back to Youth Talk on IBN Radio. I'm your host, Hana, and with us today is author and story writer and storyteller, uh, Ruxana Khan. Her website is www.ruxanakhan.com, and our website is www.ibn.net. I don't really know why people have to keep saying the W's, but it's standard, so that's what I'm doing. And this is Youth Talk. If you would like to reach me and uh, send me an email, comment, suggestion about the show, let me know what you think. Do you like it? Do you hate it? Are you neutral? Let me know 
at youthtalk at ibn.net. Again, that's youthtalk, all one word, at ibn.net. So email me. And that's an order. All right. Uh, Sister uh, Roxana, how, um, you have some excellent advice in your articles on your website, uh, roxanacon.com. Let's talk about some writing uh, tips for aspiring writers uh, mm -hmm. out there. First, first and foremost, this is my question, how can a person find time to write and how can you manage it? <laughs> well, I wrote five books while I was babysitting eight kids, well, including my own and taking care of a house and running and being a mother. Um, so I think anybody can find time if they really want to do something. It just depends on how much you really want to do it. Um, I think the, that's the key. The perseverance in, in writing is, is it's actually even more important than talent because I know of so many very talented individuals who just uh -huh. didn't have the perseverance, the stick-to-itiveness to really stick to things Stick to the writing, even when t when times got get tough. Like even now, after my moderate success, it still gets tough. It's still you still face rejection. It's not for the faint heart, faint hearted. You just have to keep keep going on. You know that that old '70s saying, "Keep uh -huh. on trucking." You just have to keep yeah. on trucking, keep going, and uh, no matter what obstacles get in your way, you have to believe in yourself and to keep going. Luckily, I, w I was lucky because my husband believed in me even from the very beginning, and he encouraged me to pursue this, and he actually helped me take courses uh -huh. and the conferences and the seminars and all of those things that, that, that led to success. How, how can you tell if you're good enough to write a book? Now, you know, if, if I'm 14, 15, or even in my 20s, and I think I write well, how can I make sure? Who do I ask? Who do I go to for a, a critique of whether oh. my work um, is even not even publishable, but even if it's if it can you know even be um, tolerated by people <laughs> or found to be interesting? What do I do? Well, there's a number of good organizations that are available, and almost all community colleges and universities have creative writing programs. I would suggest you you invest a little bit of money if you want to do this professionally. If you just want to write for pleasure, write for yourself. You don't need to do any of that. Just, nobody has to judge it. You just but if write. I want to be a writer? Yeah, if you want to be a writer, though, then you need some professional feedback. Do and I have to have studied a certain field? Not really. Um, uh, at, at one point, I was thinking of going back to f finishing my university degree and becoming a, an English major. And uh, I actually went to a... a it was the Children's Literature New England Conference in Boston. And I went there and I just thought, you know, it's not going to help me become a better writer. Writing is about emotions, and everybody has emotions. It's about perspective. It's about all those kinds of things. And you really don't need a fancy-schmancy degree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if, you, if you tap into your own inner feelings, your inner um, turmoil, struggles, all these things you can write from that perspective, and 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 taking courses and 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 literature degrees and stuff will broaden your perspective, but it's not necessarily going to help you relate to the truth that is your reality. If you're not talented, it won't bring you talent. No, it won't. That's what you're exactly, okay. it won't bring you talent. Although you might get good enough to 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 kind of get published, but to really make it. I personally believe to really make, make it in writing, you have to have actually lived long enough to have something important to say, something new and different to contribute to the mass of knowledge, the collective knowledge of everybody. And uh, this is an, an, another reason why young writers don't necessarily make it very well. Like they might have a flash in the pan, success, like a short-term thing, mm -hmm. but to really maintain a long-term successful goal, you need to work at it, you need to grow as a person, and as you grow as a person, you will grow as a writer. Now, um, one thing I find interesting about you is that you're not only an author, you're a storyteller, mm -hmm. and many uh, cultures have the tradition of folk storytelling. I know I come from one. I originally come from Sudan, and we basically grow up with our grandmothers telling us stories, and it goes generation after generation. And we, we love it. We enjoy it. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between reading a story and hearing one? Oh, they're, they're completely different. 
in, in reading a story, when you're writing one, you have to show, not tell. And when you're telling a story, uh-huh. you have to tell, you don't have to show. <laughs> um, and what I mean by show, don't tell is like if somebody is um, rich, it's, or no, like for example, I'll, I'll use an example of the roses in my carpet. Okay. In that story, the refugee boy, he's poor. Mm-hmm. I'm not once in the whole book do I say that he's poor. Mm-hmm. I never use the word poor. I actually show it to you rather than telling it to you because I show you with the, the fact that he lives in a mud house, the fact that he doesn't have much to eat, and, and, and et cetera. Now, in telling a story, you don't have the time to go into all those nitty-gritty details of showing. You're uh, dealing with it, attention span. Yeah, you know? and you don't even have to do that because your voice itself, the voice itself carries the authority of the story. And you can just say, once there was a poor boy. And the audience will take it for granted mm. that this boy is poor. You don't have to show it. So there you're telling the story. Uh-huh. And also with um, storytelling, you're often dealing with more oral tradition. You're dealing with stories that have been passed down as folk tales. And I just think some of these folk tales are, they're not, you, you can't beat them in terms of story. They've got such beautiful messages, morals, and they've, they've stood the test of time. And unfortunately, a lot of the children have not been exposed to some of these, these stories. Mm-hmm. And this is one of, the, one of the things that I wanted to do. Also, I went to a storytelling festival while I was waiting for my books to get published. So I came at this more f- first from a writing point of view, then from a storytelling point of view. And when I went to the storytelling festival, I was watching these people tell stories, and I thought, I could do this. And not only could I do this, but I could do this with the Quranic stories because those are stories that you can't really write down because you can't illustrate them. Yeah. You can't illustrate them. So this was a way that you could actually relate these stories. And I could relate these stories to non-Muslim audiences and, and, and share some of our background culture with them. And so one of so the, do you do that? Do you go oh, definitely. Do you go around schools and telling? Mm-hmm. Or, or where, where, where do you do it? I, I've done schools, libraries, storytelling festivals, events, all kinds. There are storytelling festivals. Oh, definitely, definitely. In fact, do we well, have them here in the States? Do you know about sure. that? I know in Toronto we have the Toronto in, uh, International Storytelling Festival, and I actually did two stories. I did the story of um, the Battle of Khandak mm-hmm. from, um, you know, the, the Sira. Yes. I did the story of the Battle of Khandak, and I also did the story of, of Aisha, radiallahu anh, when she lost the necklace. Wow. And I told this to a non-Muslim audience, and they were just riveted. They just absolutely enjoyed them. I called my set uh, Tales of Intrigue and Betrayal. <laughs> and that's what basically they were stories from Islamic history. I, I, I personally, let me tell you about me personally, I was, I was more of, of a storytelling uh, sort of uh, person when I was a child. I would love to be told stories mm-hmm. ra- rather than read them. Um, uh-huh. I would find, you know, the expressions of the face and and the way the voice, I could imagine everything in my head. Oh, definitely. And definitely. It, it was just an amazing um, way of, of learning also. Uh, well, I know, learned a lot. Well, you know, that. it's funny, because even in this technological age, the funny thing is, like, I go into school, and I do, I do storytelling, and even the kids that are hooked on video games and everything, you can sit there and you can tell them a story, only using your voice and inflection and, and tona- intonation and everything. And you can capture them in a, in a way that, you know, it's remarkable. Mm-hmm. Children are still so drawn to storytelling, That's and it's an underrepresented art. Do you think so? Oh, definitely, definitely. Do you think there there are enough, or what do you think of the concept of books on tape for kids? Um, I think it's a good idea. I have no problem with books on tape because um, even just the, the the idea of listening to a story, like even through reading, listening to a book on tape, it still it, it employs the imagination. And I think, in, unfortunately, sometimes in the Muslim community, ex- exercising the imagination isn't taken seriously. It's not something that um, is really encouraged or really appreciated that much, mm. you know, because we see it almost as a diversion. And it can be a diversion, but it can also be a, a great tool in instilling values and morals in a more, hmm, a more insidious kind of a deeper level, mm-hmm. on a deeper level. Do you think, um, you said as a child you didn't watch much television. I don't know if this question will be really relevant, but do you think um, when a story is taken 
and turned into a television program or into a movie. We see, you know, most of the movies today coming out of Hollywood, a lot of them, I don't can't say most of them, are actually adapted from books and from novels and mm-hmm. from stories, even some of the children's um, um, uh, movies. Mm-hmm. Do you think it does it justice? It can. It depends on the book. Um, it depends on the book. And I, have, I see nothing wrong um, it, it, with adapting books to movies because it'll give it a better, a bigger audience. Often people these days, they don't read that much, unfortunately. And um, in, in putting it into a movie, you reach a larger audience. But do you think that would be a reason why they don't read too much? you think there's too many, um, you know, visual, you know, sort of television and, 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 and movies well, out there? it's possible. It's possible that that's the reason why they don't read too much. But to me, I see them as different art forms, and I don't necessarily see them as being mutually exclusive like i know i enjoy a good movie once in a while mm. um and, and and but i still read you know and but finding time to read because reading you need quiet you need more and uh, more of a you need like time to sit and and you know you can't have too many distractions and stuff mm-hmm. but like in fact when when all these videos and movies and everything came along people thought that it would be the end of books mm. um it actually hasn't been the end of books Books have still been thriving and flourishing. It's just on a different level now. So I don't really see them as being completely like like a threat. Good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because I don't think they're going to abandon them anytime no, soon. No, I don't so. think so. And, and, and reading actually, to me, reading accesses a different part of the brain. It, it accesses a different part of your imagination. And it's, it's a deeper and more emotional experience than watching a movie. It is. It is. Mm-hmm. It is in in many ways. Actually, when you watch a movie or you see a, you know, a television show, it tends to be superficial. Well, you so, see, sort yeah. of shallow. And I don't the problem know. is, um, like the the kids who are having trouble reading, I think what what the thing is, the the, the 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 teachers don't tell them. You know what? The more you practice, the easier it'll get, and it'll get to the point where you don't actually see the words. Mm. That you actually just see the images in your mind, and you it's like you're watching a movie. Only you're more deeply immersed in what's really going on. And, 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 but you need to get a certain fluid, fluidity and facility with the language before it gets to that point. And, and, and they're not told that, it, hey, it's going to get easier. Mm. I think I was in grade about three or four when I realized this was happening. And I thought it was really strange. And I, and I wondered for a while if that's what was supposed to be happening. And then I just, you know, just started devouring books, just reading everything I could find. Now, there's a saying that goes, don't judge a book by its cover. Mm -hmm. Let's take that one literally. Isn't it wrong? Doesn't the cover of a book make a big impression? Oh, definitely. You know, how how do you choose what image you want to put on the cover? (sighs) Well, actually, I don't really get a choice. (laughs) As the writer... How is it chosen, do you think? The publishers, they're they're the ones who look at the marketing. They look at all of that. And they're the ones who decide what goes on the cover and everything. I get very little say. Because the books are, are set in a cultural context, um, I do get like uh, a chance to to vet it mm-hmm. and to see it, you know if there's any cultural inaccuracies. But other than that, I get very little choice unless I was the artist myself. That's one of the reasons I've always thought of of, of drawing. But then I'm not good enough. So <laughs> do you think um, do you think a, a, a book cover is important in oh, attracting absolutely. a person to it or not? It is important because. Um, even while there is that saying that don't judge a book, a book by its cover, people do. And um, and if a book doesn't look interesting, then it's not going to get picked up. And there are so many books out there that you need to be able to compete with your cover and everything. And in fact, yeah, so people, especially the author, takes the cover very seriously. And even the title, it's really it's it's funny how how much we obsess about titles and everything. And and um, the face of things. Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely. <laughs> More than we'd like to admit, actually. Well, yeah. <laughs> Basically, it, it is tough because you know that these things are going to affect sales. They're going to affect the reception of the book. So we have to, you have to take it seriously. All right. With us is Sister Ruxana Khan. We have a couple of minutes left uh, on Youth Talk. If you would like to uh, email me, that's youthtalk at ibn.net. And if you would like to uh, reach Sister Ruxana, all her information is on her website and her email and everything. I won't say it on the air, but you can just go and find out for yourself. Uh, that's at RuxanaKhan.com. 
and that's R-U-K-H-S-A-N-A-K-H-A-N dot com. Open the window right now. Take a look. And remember, again, that if uh, you know somebody who would have loved to listen to the show but couldn't get a chance to, uh, you can just direct them to our archives at IBN.net. Go to the archives page. Go down to Youth Talk. Click on today's uh, date, and you can listen to the show. We'll be right back after this break on Youth Talk. These are the mothers of the world. They raise every new generation. They... Uh, excuse me, pardon me. Yes? What about the nagging? Nagging? Take off the garbage, do your homework. She's helping you build good character, teaching you things like responsibility, trustworthiness, honor, compassion, integrity. Okay, okay. And because she loves you. I know you're going to say that. Kindness to mothers is a gateway to paradise. Have you shown her love today? This message has been brought to you by your American Muslim neighbors. This public service announcement is brought to you by the Islamic Media Foundation. IBN is your voice, the voice of American Muslims. Let us know what you think of our programs. Give us your comments and suggestions. Email us at feedback at ibn.net. That's feedback at ibn.net. Or send us a fax at 703-241-9658. That's 703-241-9658. Your opinion counts. Welcome back to Youth Talk on the Islamic Broadcasting Network. I'm your host, Hanat Baba, and we're wrapping up a lovely program today um, with Sister Ruksana Khan, the award-winning author and storyteller. Again, her website, www.ruksanakhan.com. Uh, you can go there and find articles. Um, and all her books are on there. There's a kids page. If you have children, they can go and play some crosswords, uh, which I found to be really fun. I already played them. I did them all. And you can uh, find out um, if there's any upcoming events, forthcoming books. There's a whole page for teachers. If you're a teacher, uh, you would want to go there definitely. And a whole bunch of good stuff. Uh, Sister Roxana, it's about time to go, but why don't we close with some final tips for aspiring writers. Many of our listeners are uh, either in college or going into college. They're choosing their career paths. Uh, one of them might be um, going into writing or authoring. What do you have to tell them? Well, first of all, just read, 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 uh, and then write, write, write. <laughs> okay. Basically, that's what it comes down to. You have to end up doing and don't get discouraged. If you really want it, then go for it. I mean, I had people tell me that uh, there's no way I would make it. And I, I was all the more determined to prove it. You had wrong. people discourage you? Oh, they do, like my own family. They said, you'll never, you know, you can't be a writer. Look the way you dress. Because mm. um, I'm the only one who wears hijab and stuff. That and you wouldn't be accepted in Yeah, they said they wouldn't take me seriously. And yet it's been the opposite, actually. It's been quite the opposite. Well, it's always wonderful to see uh, Muslim women um, making a difference. Thank you very much for being on the program. It was an honor. Oh, alhamdulillah. Thank you. And hopefully many people will visit your website today and mm, know what so you're much. all about and follow in your footsteps. I really hope we have more oh, I hope um, so. writers. That's one of the reasons I did this interview. We, we definitely need more writers and more people in the media. And again, thank you, Sister Ruksana. And you have been listening to Youth Talk on IBN Radio. I'm Hana, and I will see you again tomorrow, inshallah, at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Until then, salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. You have been with Youth Talk. Join us again next time for an in depth discussion of what really counts. This is Hanat Baba, signing off. This program has been sponsored by the Islamic Media Foundation, sharing the guidance of Allah through the broadcast media and the Internet. He's lazy. 